Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Branch by Abstraction. We are absolutely delighted to have Paul Hammond joining us today. So thanks a lot, Paul, for doing this for us. And just so for people who don't know, Paul is also one of the co-creators of the Selenium project. So we're absolutely thrilled to have him. So without further ado, over to you, Paul. OK, thanks, JD. Um, everyone can see my first slide and me in little form up in the top right-hand corner, hopefully. Cool. So uh, branch by abstraction is a technique. Um, this hails from 2006 six or so, 2007. And uh, materials made it into the materials that I did, made it into the continuous delivery book. Um, and what we think is that we should be doing this if we're in larger agile teams and they're trying to do something that's bigger and longer to achieve. Um, and then as a warning or a disclaimer for this presentation, there's lots of diagrams, but there's no code shown. Um, and we do allude to code, but don't show it. Um, and obviously this is a source control related practice. So let me, let me get into this then. Oops, click advance. Okay, so I have presented at Agile India before 2006. Um, I spoke on a topic about test driven development, refactoring dependency injection, and then Agile's big answer to big upfront architecture, which was dependency injection. And that uh, was a joyful experience in Bangalore. Um, I think uh, I flew from Salt Lake City in the States all the way to there in one go. And then two days later, <laughs> I'm flying back because the project I was on was uh, under a lot of pressure. Anyway, I also ran a Selenium workshop. Um, so that was more unstructured and you know there was people, workstations, it was slightly off site and uh, the next day, and we had lots of fun like trying to teach and Selenium and work through problems. And then, you know, maybe at that stage in 2006, acknowledge how much of Selenium had yet to be written. Anyway, I've been doing trunk based development for a long time, advocating for it. As I said, the materials made it into the continuous delivery book. Um, artwork from a project was somewhat anonymized and then put into that book. Um, I've got my own book out now, 2020, probably 10 years too late from when I should have done it. Um, Trunk-based development and branch by abstraction, this topic. So there's a short link to the book. Um, it's on LeanPub and uh, I'm still updating the odd page in it, but it's mostly complete. So here we go. Um, if we imagine a layer cake, that is how we develop software in modern agile teams, uh, Paul, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, really sorry for one second. Uh, there's a small toast uh, on the conference website which says that you're sharing your screen. So there's a hide button. So if you could click that, uh, that toast message will disappear. Can you see that one? It's it's right. on the conference website. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that one. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the interruption. Things your own eyes can't see. <laughs> okay, um, so we have a layer cake view or representation of what the largest set of modern agile and lean practices are in the context of DevOps, in the context of safe workspaces. Um, everything the agile signatories wrote about is still still true. But what we think now is, you know, if we have solid development infrastructure, that's our own workstations and the, the cloudy infrastructure we might be running the likes of Jenkins in. Um, we have source control, we do trunk-based development. On top of that, and we acknowledge that there's some overlap, we do continuous integration. Of course, continuous integration is largely um, talked about, but quite often mal-implemented, meaning that's not continuous integration when a com company is claiming to do it, they're not quite, but nonetheless, people have an understanding they should be doing it. Layered on top of continuous integration is continuous delivery, and layered on top of that, is lean experiments were really facilitated. So if you've got all of these things achieved right at the top, you can do cost-effective, quick lean experiments. And whether that experiment was successful or not, you can judge it to be a success and plan the next experiment. Now, if you've got a bad branching model, let's say not trunk-based development, um, you could say that your continuous integration is probably not really continuous integration and that continuous delivery could easily be a myth or a uh, thing you can't quite attain. And lean experiments is probably impossible. So 
So I'm trying to represent a precarious cake in a layer cake model on the right hand side there. Now, uh, because we need to get through this to get to branch by abstraction, I'm going to enumerate some bad branching models. So this one here, we have an idea that as a large team, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people in a dev team, we might be doing a release one branch and then there could be a team that follows us for release 1.1 that takes daily merges from us. So this is a real branching model, it's not so often used, but these daily merges in a cascading style uh, can prove to be problematic, which I represent on the right. And I'm using green here to indicate the automatic build, you could call that the CI build, is passing. That means compile, unit test, integration test, functional test, slam, and, and friends or alternates. Um, and the red means it's not compiling or not the build's not passing. And then, you know, you have an implication if that's not working at a moment in time in the release one branch, how could you possibly merge that to the release one point branch? Or if you do, you're merging known broken codes. So this uh, way of working for a large team probably has days where code isn't merged uh, because it wasn't passing the CI build in the preceding branch in the cascade. I actually encountered this, come to that in a case study later. Another bad branching model. This one's more like the old clear case style, uh, a main line where people are not active. People are active on release branches. The intention is to merge that back to main line. Um, but let's say if we had 40 people, devs and QA automators active in the release one branch, before we've gone live with release 1.1, sorry, 1.0, we might find that somebody said, we have to start the release 1.1 branch because of the lead time for all the development features we have to make for that. So what will happen is we'll start whilst release one is part complete, uh, keep working. And then after release one goes out, we'll merge code into the release 1.1 branch. And then that repeats release 1.2. So the, in theory, the thing looks like it would on the left, you know, in a reasonable case. But in reality, smaller on the right, bottom right, we see there's large periods of time where, say, Jenkins or equivalent is not passing for the branch in question. And then you have to wonder why you're merging code from that branch if it's not passing the build. Um, and then you're in this, this nightmare of broken code moving around all the place. And your release branch in question is only green the day before you go live, or maybe the hour before you go live. And you have unplanned releases following planned releases. And it's a nightmare. And I've, I've encountered that particular model many times too, in larger enterprises particularly. So this one's correlated with maybe quarterly releases, quarterly planned releases. So release one, release 1.1, and release 1.2 are the planned releases. And the 0.01 releases following those are unplanned. So uh, last word on branching models before we move to branch abstraction. I'm going to say in plenty of my materials, the Git flow is a bad branching model. Uh, I will understand that this year, the author of Git flow noted that there are other choices too. I'm also going to say that GitHub flow, 2008 contribution to our field from the GitHub people, um, is very close to trunk based development. So we might say that trunk based development has a few styles. We could say that we could do this direct to trunk. Um, if you're in subversion, that's your only choice, really. <sighs> that's maybe team size one to 100, and 100 being like the max. But reasonably, our dev teams these days are like one to 10 or one to 20. There's a second mode of operation, GitHub flow, the short lived feature branch model, and that could maybe scale up to 1000 people. That's where you have branches and you bring those in very quickly, short short amounts of time. Um, and, uh, you know, code review happens on that pull request branch before it gets consumed into the master, the trunk, or whatever you want to call it these days. Now, there's a third model, the one Google do, it's with a patch queue. This doesn't involve a real branch within the source control system. It's marshaled the patch. It would be will be replayed and merged on the head of trunk but only after code review. This one Google's managed to scale up in the many tens of thousands 
other companies are trying to copy this model if they can, uh, but that's not every company. You know, really, it's the big companies that want high throughput and everyone moving as a single unit on a larger plan, but with release independence for the facets, the modules, the components, the services, the applications within that larger trunk. So that would, in the end, be a big mono repo. Okay, branch by abstraction, the problem it solves specifically. Uh, branch diagram, time going left to right, as the previous ones. We have a representation of the trunk or the main line on the bottom. We have an imagination that there's some releases, 1, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, and 1 1.4. And then we have a thing that we're trying to achieve. So this could be non-functional, like a change in persistence technology, or it could be functional, like delivery of uh, multiple parts or rectangles of a thing uh, that have uh, stories mapped to them that the business would understand and pay for. But we know it's going to take ages to finish. In fact, we know it's going to take more than one release to finish. So what we're going to do in the old way is make a branch for that and then merge it back when it's finished. And if we've got our planning right, and all of that functionality was supposed to go out for release 1.4, we merge it back when it's completed after 1.3 goes live and before 1.4 goes live. So that's our big thing to change. Our fear, and this is maybe us as devs, practitioners, but also us as management, um, the people that see the budget, that look at the larger schedule, our fear is that there could be problems in the schedule as we go, and there are unplanned releases. So these are the ones with dotted lines and the little uh, point 0.1 suffixes. And we also imagine that there's a possibility that the team or person who's doing the big to change thing might miss their date on their completion, and it would merge back after 1.4 goes out. Right? So maybe 1.4 has to go out on that date because marketing is driving that or the business or competitors or a number of other prerogatives. Maybe um, our fear is commenting out code, merge, unmerge, and a whole bunch of things that really impact 1.4 versus just slip 1.4, which is what a reasonable team would do if they had the choice. So a nightmare, the business would cancel this big to change thing. It might be invisible to them. That's the changing of a under underpinning technology. So the business observed that there was releases going out and then all of a sudden there's not releases going out or there's a problematic thing. But they do remember that releases were going out before and they were going out just well. So now they say, okay, don't do that big thing. Just carry, go back to work. It's in their mind because they saw releases as work and they've canceled this effort on you and they can do because they're the paymasters. And the problem for you is that you probably figured you needed to do it or that you bargains that you were close and you just needed another period of time. But for many reasons, the business could have lost patience. So we could also, as I mentioned just now, we could be in this peril that we say, we have to unmerge code or comment it out in order to get the 1.4 release out. Because something that was planned to be merged, integrated with it and go out with 1.4 wasn't ready. And we had to do all of this work to make sure that something could go out on the dates that 1.4 was supposed to go out. So last minute replanning is the hallmark of waterfall. You know, Agile is able to predict if we're on schedule, maybe have plans and steps and processes and practices to mitigate the fact that we're not on schedule, we can still get something out. But this merge back of the big branch is like a waterfall technique. And, you know, we could have had 50 people on that branch and 30 working on regular functional intervals and the cost of unmerging a whole bunch of code or commenting stuff out would be huge, especially if that wasn't a feature, it was a whole release branch anyway. So long live branches ultimately become our way of working. Um, we showed one of those bro broken branch models earlier and uh, we never get back to a high flow, continuous delivery centric way of doing things. So, there's that branching model, that broken branching model. So you had a plan to just make a branch just the once and then merge it back for the big thing. But you end up in this reality where release teams are now marshaled on branches, working there. Nobody's working on the main line. 
and code only comes back to the main client main line in batches when it's complete and it's coming back with a merge tool merge technique within the source control package which in itself is never defect free merge conflicts three-way merges and all sorts of things like that huge pressure on the merge team to get it done because other teams need to merge immediately after they've merged the main line main line or they don't they try and leapfrog over from say the release one branch to the release 1.1 branch new problems so branch by abstraction uh, what we do instead so this time i'm just going to represent that trunk left to right again is time we imagine we have release 1 1.1 1 1.2 1.3 1.4 we imagine these green dots are commits on the trunk um stylized these green dots are passes of builds, right? So these are Jenkins woke up, Circle CI, Travis, whatever, ran through compile, unit tests, integration tests, which are multifaceted, but in my book would include Selenium um, or equivalent. And everything passed, right? So I used to get to clients quite often and they'd ask me, what percentage of red versus green do we accept within a well functioning? dev team and I was always confused as to what they meant by that but they were wanting to hear 80% or something like that because that was their reality as a team that every build that runs 80% of the tests pass and 20% fail so of course the correct the correct answer is all the tests pass and none of them fail this red dot here um, hopefully um, colorblind people can forgive me the red dot here is uh, no handshakes no no uh, no waving hands no colorblind people uh, <laughs> This red dot here is a failing build. Now in a high functioning team, we're gonna see the build automation technology itself, Jenkins, gonna roll that back. Or, you know, if that was on the trunk, if it's on a pull request branch, we're not gonna roll it back. We're gonna give maybe the dev in question a chance to maybe fix it so that it goes green. But when it's merging back to the trunk as the pull request is consumed, it's represented as green here, not the interstitial red state that happened whilst that was a work in progress you know we could argue whether those are bad habits that we should ever be using jenkins to find out whether we did or didn't break the build. we should know in my opinion and many others we should know before we do the commit and the push so that red dot okay it's anomalous here but i'm just including it because we need to understand that people and time and timing accidents will see breakages of the build on the trunk but we're going to say it gets rolled back so in the next representation, we're imagining the teammates that are active in this particular trunk. There's the there's five devs at the bottom, and uh, when I say dev, I also mean QA automator. Um, and they're business on they're busy with business as usual, and they're actually doing the lime green uh, commits, the dark green ones. Hopefully, you can see the difference in the two colors, two shades of green. The dark green ones are the activities over time, spanning several releases of the developer or developers who is doing the big to change thing. So that could be non-functional, like a change in persistence technology or a, an upgrade of Spring or something like that that could take a while. Actually, that's a bad example. Um, something that can be done on a piecemeal basis that takes a lot of things to achieve. Um, so, We've got two representations of color here, so we can set the scene for the next slide, which is what happens at the beginning of a branch by abstraction exercise from the point of view of the developer who is doing the work towards this big to, uh, this long to change thing. So we're imagining um, that they have a rule that they constrain themselves to, and that is that they can't commit anything to the trunk that would break the build for them or for anyone else. So that's eternally true. But their first commit for the thing we want to change is to introduce an abstraction. So depending on our language, let's say you know Java has inheritance. Um, many other languages don't, or they have different paradigms like functional programming. But we might say whether it's inheritance or compositional or functional, we will make an abstraction for the thing that should be changed from old to new. And as soon as we've made that abstraction, we're going to split something that was not abstracted into 
an implementation of that abstraction. Um, and then for shorthand, we'll just call that the branch of abstraction change. And we're going to have a mechanism in the code base that is allowing a toggle between the new state for that abstraction um, and the old state. But this is a uh, toggle is not going to do a lot because all we did was split this uh, this technology, this uh, component into two, like the abstraction and then the implementation of the abstraction. Um, and we're going to make sure before we do a commit that this is passes for me and it passes for everyone else as represented by Jenkins, Circle CI, and the like. So from everyone else's point of view, all the other developers within the team, they don't see uh, this particular change in a way that is benign to them. They only focused on their functional deliverables, which are the lime green pieces that are going into the trunk. They're still chasing the release 1.1 branch. That's still a week away or something like that. But the code that the other teammate had delivered inside the trunk is inactive from their point of view. Uh, there was a famous article from 10 years back or more that talked about dark deployments. I can't remember. I think it was uh, Business Insider had an article that said something like uh, the next version of Facebook is something you're already using. You just can't see it. Um, we could call these toggles or flags, or we could have any other mechanism that allows us to turn off the feature for the rest of the team because they're focused on functional deliverables and is only active for the dev in question, but it's all inside one trunk. No branch is involved yet. So let's roll that forwards and say, partway through this exercise, um, we're much further on. The dev is working, the so dev working on the branch for abstraction work is uh, continuing in the same vein, the same prerogative. Every commit they do could go live, doesn't affect functionally anything, is safe. You know, whatever way of phrasing the same constraint is, it's true. The developer never deviates from that. But they're making more commits as they go. So that could be more abstractions more implementations of abstractions. That could be a refactoring of a, you took a piece and you just split it into two using the refactoring tools in hopefully a JetBrains product. Um, you know, that could be introduce um, interface in IntelliJ um, or one of five or six different refactoring menu options that amount to the same thing. Anyway, they're making perhaps now second implementations of the same abstraction. So let's say this was an attempt to get from a persistence technology that's now passe to a new persistence technology that the company wants to bet on. Uh, we could see an abstraction for the entity in question with an old, say, Hibernate way of implementing that component and a new, say, Mybatis way of implementing the component. So they're going to make the second implementation driven by that flag or toggle or whatever or some other mechanism and all of this was in, is within the code base that could be xml or json or yaml or some other technology that signals whether for this particular component we use the old or the new and from everyone else's point of view it's using the old from this developer's point of view it's using the new now they could do a burn down chart based on this um, which allows them to do some predicting around how long it's going to take. But anyway, let's say release 1.1 went out and they're facing release 1.2 here. They're still not complete on the larger exercise, but the rest of the developers are only focused on the functional deliverables for 1.2, as a represent here. So they do maybe see the prior work, but the new stuff that's going in, they're less concerned with. Now, we could say that just keeps going, keeps iterating. We don't know how long it's going to take, which is one of the hallmarks of an agile project. Uh, let's focus on the top right hand corner. Hang on, I'm going to I'm going to move my introduce more or refine abstractions. Uh, work on implementations of those abstractions. Refactor, hopefully in a JetBrains tool. Don't break the builds. Uh, make sure the code remains inactive for everyone else. So that's the major coding activity. Now, each time they do a new abstraction, a new implementation, 
abstraction, sorry, a new separation of a component into implementation and abstraction. And they're making the second implementation of the same thing in the new technology. Then they have an opportunity for new unit tests and they should focus on this. Um, it's probably okay to clone, to copy paste the previous tests into the new one. Uh, it will become clearer why that's good, but for production code, we would never say cut and paste is a good way of doing stuff. But for test logic in a procedure like this, it's okay if that's quickest way of doing it. Anyway, so let's say they have a unit test for the old way still, and they have a new unit test for the new way of doing the same thing. So only a unit test, not integration test. Um, you know, this larger exercise should be done on a code base with tests. Then, you know, as many releases are actually happening on this timeline, they're actually going live as part of those releases, but with everything they're doing turned off because the toggle or the flag or whatever it is, is representing the old way for the longest time until stuff is complete. So completion, that mythical 1.4 release. When, when we get to that place and we're 100% happy with what we're doing, uh, we might flip the toggle for everyone. So that that Dev 5, I don't know if you can see that was Dev 5. Dev 5 has now joined the larger team again, is no longer involved in the exercise, which Branch for Abstraction was doing. The code is still in the code base, at least initially, but we've uh, toggled it on for everyone. So if we were flipping persistence technologies, which is non-functional, we'll now have done that for everyone. The old code's still there, the unit test is still passing, but in production at least, 1.4, that code is not active anymore. It is now the dark code. The code that's working is the new way of working, which has been tested in every dimension, unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, and even maybe a QA team has stood up environments and is clicking through the application, making sure that it functions as it did before. Now, if we're live for a day, a week, or some period of time that's deemed to be safe, we're going to remove the old implementation, say the Hibernate implementation. We're going to remove the abstraction that underpinned that, meaning uh, the implementation of each abstraction no longer extends or implements an interface or some other idiom. And we're going to remove the toggle that governed this. So we can't flip the old one back on again. Code's gone, toggle's gone. Um, and now our code base exists without reference to the prior technology and only source control history shows that for the same trunk. Now, of course, I think it would be best to do that after a delay because you never know when you don't change your mind and go back to the other way of working. So other economic benefits. The branch of abstraction process is pausable and resumable. So remember we said earlier that a business group, paymasters, could decide to cancel our work because it's taking too long and they don't believe it can ever finish. This one, let's say, if your competitor does something really super important and you'd put your best developers on the branch for abstraction effort and you want to now beat your competitor or react to your competitor's deliverables, you could move those developers back to the main team, get them work on functional deliverables. You know, you've, you've pivoted and rapidly reprioritized new business deliverables and dropped other in progress work. And we could go and do that and we could ship a release. And then when we're breathing a sigh of relief after that effort has gone to production, we could move the same developers back to the branch by abstraction effort within the same trunk and just pick up where we left off. None of the code had gone stale on a branch, which is one of the other hallmarks of canceling those efforts where they were marshaled on a branch. Um, Another economic benefit, the business never observes no releases. The releases are going out, maybe on a cadence, one a month, one a week, one a day, 10 a day. It doesn't matter. This longer to achieve branch by abstraction work is just working in tandem to everything else that's happening there. Um, you know, if this is just a way of working, uh, the business people have only ever experienced this when they got to a company or a, a, a future employer that was doing it the other way on a branch, the business people with no tech skills, no dev skills, would be screaming, screaming 
about how bad that way of working is versus their old company. You know, of course, all of us have old company itis. We remember a project which we count as our favorite and we pine for it in the years that follow. Um, Georg can decide to cancel the branch of abstraction effort completely without any costly unmerge or rework. So let's say, you know, if it was a functional change rather than non-functional and we were doing it over a period of time, but halfway through the effort, we decided that the old way was best because we've done A-B testing or competitors have all moved to the way that we think we shouldn't be doing anymore. And now we want to go back to it. It's very easy to just shorten to the end, which is removal of the abstraction, removal of the toggle, and removal of one of the two implementations or what was part complete as one of the two implementations. So at any time we can say this effort is finished and rather than pause it because we know we're going to come back or we wish to come back, we can actually remove it. And that's a, a day's work for one of the developers is to remove all of the code that's going to be turned off forever. Maybe it's not our original intention, but we're allowed this optionality uh, born from this technique. Now, lastly, um, the organization can casually reprioritize um, in this particular instance, we talked about releases 1.12, 1.3, 1 1.4. Imagine we wanted all the feature set of 1.4 to go out before 1.3. Um, and if we did, if we had a larger sophisticated design of having dark code, toggles, and branch by abstraction to do the longer to achieve things, it's now just an issue of flipping toggles, running some experiments to see how viable 1.4 releases without the 1.3 features, because that's effectively what you've done, um, fixing some bugs, and then going live. So that's you know hedging as a strategy is built into branch by abstraction as a larger architectural design and the toggles that come with that. So I have uh, two case studies. First one's a bank. Um, it was a bank in the USA. Uh, foreign exchange, FX trading is where you um, sell dollars to buy yen or rupees or whatever, and vice versa. And you can just trade straight, or you can have futures or options and uh, several derivative products based on foreign exchange trading. And sophisticated stacks deliver all of those and have large corporate and institutional account holders within that system, you know, including manufacturing companies. They'll potentially make their product in China, um, sell it in the US and sell it in the UK, for example, but they might not move the money from UK sales back to the US to then move it again to China to pay for the manufacturing. They might just move the money from the UK to China. And if they're doing that, they're not using high street banks for foreign exchange trading, they're using trading systems like this to do that anyway. The bank in question had three planned releases a year. They had a few more unplanned releases um, quickly following each planned release. Uh, I've got a, a blog entry on a, a cynical view of bonuses based on how what your release cadence is and how much of a how much release drama there is in release week and release weekend and how many unplanned releases you do following a planned release. Um, but that's more of an entertainment blog entry than anything that's super relevant. So between two releases, we decided to re-architect what we were doing in the code base, the build system, source control technologies, branching model, the whole shebang. So we did seven things in parallel, um, two of which were methodical branch by abstraction efforts, uh, both of them non-functional. So one was to change the business messages on the wire. So that would be a you know a buy or a sell or a something or other of a particular currency. You know orders that haven't been consumed, trades that have been consumed, blah blah blah. We wanted to change them from binary on the wire to XML. And the second change we wanted to make, and these are not these weren't my decisions. These are what we inherited, was to change the message technology. So let's say you know Active MQ is a message technology. So is uh, Kafka, and you could have gone from one to the other because somebody said it was better. And maybe one is better than the other, but either way, you wanted to change message bus technologies and you wanted to change the message 
uh, format on the wire. So both of these efforts and five other parallel things were achieved between releases. Um, these two pieces were done with branch by abstraction in parallel in the same team. So the same team was like seven people and uh, one at times or two at times people would focus on one or more aspects of this branch by abstraction uh, um, plan uh, towards a goal. And as it happens, they were complete inside of one release, but they could have taken longer and left it toggled off. All in all, all seven pieces were finished early, as were all the functional deliverables for the release. And the team went and pushed something out two weeks early and in a three month schedule or four month schedule, that's not amazingly early, but it's early enough for the business to notice. So they went live ahead of schedule and the business um, applauded the team. Now, in terms of doing seven things in parallel, probably that was foolish. Uh, it's, you know, I was the guy that architected the seven things and uh, nobody told me we shouldn't do it. But if I think back, somebody sure as hell should have done. We were lucky. Next case study, airlines some years later. USA again, uh, it's a major airline. It's not Pan Am. Pan Am doesn't exist anymore. But hey, if I put Pan Am's picture up, then nobody can think I'm talking about a specific airline. Uh, they had a C++ stack and they were moving to Java. It was a rewrite. They didn't have maybe a huge amount of time for their old technology, even though it had done them really well within their industry. And they wanted to strangle the old application in a series of releases into the new Java solution. I mean, if you're doing it today, you might do this in Node.js. But they wanted to do it um, without having a major rewrite period. And they were doing a cascade model where the release two team was merging into the release three teams branch or the release three team was merging release two teams um, changes every day or every week. And the release three te four team was trying to merge from release three and the release five team was trying to merge from release four. And it was so problematic. It was slowing down all development. So we uh, presented on how to move to trunk based development. It's relevance, explain Google were doing it and others. And we said we should wrap everything up in toggles and have abstractions for all of these uh, very rectangular pieces of the user interface that could be A or B, with or without. And because all of these teams were working in parallel, concurrent development of consecutive releases, um, it meant we had many toggles and many abstractions. So um, sometime later, after successfully rolling out a number of releases in the shed on this basis, something happened that was unplanned, which was to do with an acquisition and some uh, launch date for a bigger thing. And it was pretty bad in that uh, one of the other partners outside the organization they were going to integrate with wouldn't be ready. And because that was a waterfall team that was notified late. So the, the, my colleagues in question were asked, are we going to be ready? I'd moved on by this stage. Are we going to be ready? And uh, my successor within the the client um, flipped some toggles, spun up a new Jenkins pipeline, and said, "Actually, bar for one bug, which we've already fixed, we are ready." And that that notification was a matter of hours later after the execs within the IT department had said, "What is the cost of this particular resequencing of releases?" So they had a massive unmerge fear or a commenting out fear, but my successor had got it over the line with colleagues and went back to the same exec team and said, we're good to go. So at that stage, I think the execs within the, the airline moved from fearful, doubting, concerns, overseeing, they moved to like enlightened, convinced converts to trunk-based developments and branch of abstraction and toggles. Um, so saving them a fortune. Anyway, so in summary, we might say branch by abstraction um, is instead of branch by source control. And it's only for this specific instance, like the long to achieve thing. Uh, I'll give you a single tip if you're going to do it within your team. Focus on the most dependent on and least dependent component first. If you had 400 components to work through, which one first is going to be the most dependent on and least depending? For the, for the bank, uh, it was an object called currency. Everything else used that. Uh, bizarrely, later at a big search company, 
um, I did the analysis of another hairball solution and found currency to be the same object in the middle of it that was the Gordian knot um, of uh, entanglement. But we didn't change that scene. So I, I run an info portal, branchofabstraction.com. Um, in there, I redescribe everything we've just discovered um, in a different way to the way in which we've just discovered it. So I do three tellings of the story. One of them is a series of sequence diagrams. So if you're familiar with UML sequence diagrams, that's in there. There's another way of telling the same story. This one's with codes, and it's in a way too simple Java app, Java app but it gets it across what all the choreographed steps would be, you know, abstraction, toggle, removal of abstraction. And then there's another one, which is pictures only, which is a stylized reimagination of the Empire State Building in New York in uh, black and white sketched uh, pictures. And it's not my artwork. I, uh, I found somebody to make better art than I can possibly do. And it's half possible as, a, as another way of telling the same story, for at least for non-coders. OK, so that was my last slide. So uh, we're at questions. Yeah, Paul, I'm just trying to see if there are any questions. Guys, If there are, we've still got a few minutes. So if you have any questions, just uh, add them to the chat. So which branching strategy is ideal for the team? Uh, in all cases, trunk-based development, um, you know, you could say GitHub flow is close enough. Uh, there's a small, small technicality on where you release from. For a reasonable sized modern team, GitHub Flow is what you should do. It's a faithful reproduction of trunk based development, which predates it. Okay. This is one more by uh, Carol. It says uh, Do you require a mature continuous deployment process to implement a branch by abstraction? You don't, no. So if you were, say, uh, that quarterly team, that's where you're at now, and you had the big to achieve thing. You could do whatever you needed to do with branch by abstraction and then get your um, deployment out on a quarterly basis. Now, there's, there's two CDs, right? There's continuous deployment, which is the into production by triggered by a commit. And then there's continuous delivery, which is into QA or into UAT triggered by a commit and the, all the builds, all the build steps passing. So for that quarterly team, probably is not going to do continuous deployment but they might be doing continuous delivery, meaning every successful build bounces the QA stack so that people could go in and check it and say, oh, look at that. The new feature has been, uh, Vipul delivered the new feature. Or Paul, do, we, do you want to take another one? There are yeah, I'll take another here. one. So, okay, this might be a big one, but okay. So is this basically a replacement for any standard source control branching? How would this work for multiple component and client teams? Well, I'm, It'd be hard I'm gonna, to answer that in a minute, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, go I'm going to say this is standard source control branching. Trunk-based development is, uh, is standard source control branching. Branch by abstraction is a technique that you will use in conjunction with trunk-based developments mm -hmm. for a specific problem that you're encountering. Like most functional deliverables are like a day to work on and to finish, commit, test, approve, code review, and all that. But if this is going to take you eight weeks to do and that you're doing one release a week, you're probably going to borrow this branch by abstraction technique as part of your standard trunk-based development branching model. I hope that nailed it. OK, I think uh, we're pretty much out of time. So should we wind things up, Paul? And uh, yeah. guys, if you want to uh, interact with Paul directly, you can find him in the lounge uh, in a bit. So yeah, a lot of thumbs up coming from Paul. Yeah, OK, thanks a lot, guys. OK, okay. thank okay. everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Paul, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for watching this okay. session. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.